This guy came in the shop with a guitar he said was owned by Jimi Hendrix. If this was actually owned and played by the legend himself, this will be the coolest guitar ever to walk into my shop. And I will go to great lengths to buy this guitar. I have to. This is stupid cool. I mean, <laughs> Jimmy's one of Jimmy's guitars. <laughs> Hendrix turned the guitar into an extension of his body. Every way he moved was altering the sound of the guitar. When you see him dip down real low, he's bending the guitar. Yeah, physically sound out of it. bending right. the guitar. Right, right. There's very few guys that can make their own statement with the guitar anymore. That guys come along like Jimi Hendrix and just take it to a completely new place. I want to make sure this is 100% before we start talking a lot of money. Yeah, you mind if I take a look at it? No, man, by all means, that's why you're awesome. here. There's a couple of things you'd want to look at. The tremolo bar. These are usually bent and angled up. He played the guitar upside down. He flattened a lot of these out, made them straight. So they probably weren't ramming into his arm and stuff like that. Another thing is what they call ring wear. If you're playing the guitar like this, my wedding ring hits the guitar, removes a lot of the paint, finish from there. If you look at this guitar, the top side of the neck has a lot of that wear. That's from the guitar being this way. How Jimmy would have played it. Left-handed. The article that you guys have sitting over there, they asked a bunch of vintage dealers to take a look at this guitar with photos and stuff like that. The serial number here, L14985. This guitar has actually been documented. No doubt, this is definitely one of Jimmy's guitars. That's really, really cool. In my head, I think I know what it's worth, but what do you think? No guitar is worth anything unless everything's working on it, in my book. <laughs> <laughs> Plug it in, let it rip, Let's just do turn this. it up loud. Cannot believe this. That's a good guitar, man. So what do you think it's worth? Anywhere from 750 to good auction million. <sighs> All right, thanks, buddy. All right, man. Thank you. Yes, thanks, thanks again man. for letting yeah, me play. You're welcome, man. Thanks a lot. That felt crazy to hold one of Jimi Hendrix's guitars, man. You could see why he liked it, because it was a really good, balanced, nice feeling guitar. On a personal level, I absolutely love it, but you have to find the right auction. It has to be advertised in the least amount of time would be a year, most likely. Right. <sighs> Let me give you 450,000. 450? Man. I, I, my, my thing is, I take all the risk, you walk away with the cash. For a guitar that could fetch maybe a million dollars on any day, your guy, own guy just told you that. Okay, but like, what we Come do on, 450 grand? Yeah, I'm thinking 750, man. A lot of commissions and a lot of people got to get paid to sell this thing. Okay? <laughs> right. It's just uh, the, it's the way the world works. Right. Okay. I'll give you half a million. This guitar's worth more than that. It it, it just is. If you want the money now, I can go five fifty. Knowing that it could potentially fetch a million dollars at an auction, I can't leave that much money on the table. Uh, Seven fifty, really, man. That's a that's a bottom dollar I can take for the guitar. Okay, well, have a nice day. Tell me if it goes to auction, I might bid on it. Okay. <sighs> Thanks, man. Well. Six. I can't do it, man. But I'll call you if I change my mind. Call me. Okay. All right, man. He's fired one last bullet across the boat there with, with the $600,000 offer, you know? Honestly, I was starting to kind of get a little bit more tempted by that, but if you want to come to a fair point in selling something of great value, don't be desperate about it, and that I am not. A guy came in the shop with an original Moby Dick classic comic. It's pretty cool, but I have no idea what it's worth, so I called Paul in to help me out. He brought this Moby Dick comic in, and I figured you're the guy who could tell me about it. Really cool, man. You could tell it's a first original edition, which is pretty rare, just by the 10 cent. If you have a 15 cent or blank, it's most likely a reprint. So how collectible is this in the comic book world? Well, this book actually has a pretty rare variant. 
on the regular edition, on the inside front cover, there is a letter from the editor. The other one is an interior cover that's a free promo kind of thing. That's very rare, and I've seen like two. Well, I didn't look at the first page, so let's So let's find see out. what it says, all right? All right, this is the letter to the editor, so this is the regular one. What kind of value would you put on it? Overall, I mean, the colors are great. You do have some damage along the edge, the stain here. But uh, it's a really nice book, really nice copy. Is it $600 nice? I think it's closer to $550 nice. OK, well, that's not too far off. Thanks, man. You got it, Charlie. All right. Having an original edition complete is really something that people look out for. I think it'll be a good buy for the shop. It might take a little time for that right person to walk in, but I think it'll sell. All right, well, after hearing everything you had to say, how much are you willing to let it go for? Well, I, I know you're going to need a little bit of room, so 500. <sighs> I got to take all the risk with someone handling it and selling it and 100 different people looking at it. Would you go 350 on it? I'd be much happier at 450. I could do 375, but I think that's my limit on it. Well. All right, 375. All right, we got a deal. Um, just meet me right up here at the counter. Okay. I'm selling on $375 because that does allow me to get my original purchase price back and to find a nice whaling book that my dad will enjoy. This is Elvis's Superfly coat. I dig it. <laughs> One of the most iconic pieces of Elvis wardrobe in the collector's market. You're saying this was, this belonged to Elvis? It did. Here's a picture of him wearing it. Awesome. Cool. Um, it has a fur cape. It doesn't get any better than that. He was known for his um, taste in clothing. <laughs> oh. I've been here before. I'm coming back because they treated me fairly last time. I like making deals with these guys. To me, Elvis represents America. He's one of the most iconic figures of the 20th century. I mean, there's only two people that could pull off that look, and that's Elvis and maybe a pimp. This thing's pretty cool. Can I try it on? I think it might fit you. <laughs> pretty fly for a white guy. Where's my money? <laughs> Where's my money? <laughs> Take it off. Well, I feel super fly, that's for sure. <laughs> How much were you looking to get out of it? 75000 OK. Um, do you mind if I have someone look at this thing? I mean, it is really cool. I mean, it's a massively iconic thing. Well, who would you like to call in? You know who Jimmy Belba is, right? Yep, okay. I sure do. Knows a lot about his memorabilia and things like that. Let me give him a call, and we'll go from there. OK. They told me they're bringing in Jimmy Velvet. He is probably the best expert on Elvis artifacts. If anybody is going to know it's original, it's going to be him. I met Elvis through my English teacher. Through your English teacher? Yeah. Were sure. you like his tutor or something? No. Are you kidding? I, need, I needed the tutor. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's how we met. She informed me that Elvis was going to record a song the following month that she wrote. And that song was Heartbreak Hotel. Well, I used to own numerous Elvis museums around the country, five total. I specialize in anything and everything else. It must have been pretty cool hanging out at Graceland. It was always cool. You never knew what was going to happen there. You know, there was always something, and Elvis was very impatient. So you get on the plane, you're in the air, and he, he wants to go get a cheeseburger. <laughs> but he did stuff like this. You never knew. So what do you think of the jacket? There's so much fake stuff out there. You pay a big dollar, but you got to be very careful what you buy. He had a bunch of these made, all different colors. This brown one, this is the one. He wore it quite a lot. It mostly, uh, to the hotels and back from the airplane, he kept this on the plane. Sure. One thing I really wanted to see is the IC costume label. Ah. Tell me, did you ever see Elvis in this? 
in this exact one? Yes. So you think this is the real deal? I know it is. OK. The other big question, what's it worth? Hmm. The fading is going to cost a little. If I was trying to buy this coat, I would love to get it for somewhere between $50,000, $55,000. It's a great coat. It's more than a coat. It's, it's Elvis, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Thank Bob. you, sir. Seeing that coat today brought back a lot of memories. I know people who would probably pay $60,000 or more for it. It's just a grand piece of history. So what do you think I should pay for it, chum? 40 grand. That's about right. I mean, you know what collectibles have done in the past few years. I mean, mm -hmm, the price sure. has gone down. It's not come up. But the good stuff always remains high. And I mean, this is, it doesn't get much better for Elvis yeah, stuff here. $40,000 seems like a really high figure, OK? I take it off your hands. I take all the risk, and I have to sell it. 70 grand. I can't do it. 40 grand. I mean, I'm giving you my best number right off the bat. That's what I can do. The jumpsuits go for hundreds of thousands. And although this is not stage worn, this is the next best thing. If it wasn't a good piece, I wouldn't be offering you 40 grand. OK. I'll go 50. No, I'll go 40 grand. I I'm giving you my best shot. I really am. Mm. You can't do 50. 40 grand. All right, just for you. I'll do 45. I'll go 40 grand. I, don't, I can't do that. I mean, 40, I have, I, 45, you got a deal. It's a big investment. I can't take a loss on it, though, so. 45, I'll do it. You gonna let it walk over $5,000, Rick? The deal's not right. The deal's not right, dude. OK. All right, man, I wish we could work. Change your mind. Give me a call. You don't want to do 45? I'll go 40. You got it. All right, write him up, chum. Sweet. All right, I'll meet you right over there. Let me put the jacket on first. Go write him up. Go write him up. I thought Jimmy's appraisal of 50 to 60 was a little bit low. Prices now are a lot higher than they were back then. What can I help you with? I got this picture here. Uh... It's from, like, it says 1500s. As far as I'm concerned, this is like a scary picture. I mean, I wouldn't want to hang this on my wall. I really like it. You're a weird individual for liking this stuff. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> I came to the pawn shop because I have an old print that I have to sell. If it's any value, I'm uh, retired, so I could use the money. If I got a couple of grand, I'd be happy. If I got more, it'd be even nicer. Where in the world did you get this? Well, I got it from my mother. It was in the family a lot of years, so uh, I sort of bait on it. Just thought maybe it might be worth something. Yeah, believe it or not, you got something really cool here. Oh, really? This is an engraving by Albrecht Dewar. Actually, he's a pretty famous artist. As a matter of fact, he's really famous. Uh -huh. I mean, he was probably the greatest engraver of the Renaissance. Albrecht Dewar was obsessed with the idea that the world would end in some kind of apocalypse, like in the Bible. So most of his work included demons and satanic creatures. 500 years later, he is still influencing gothic artists and even horror movie directors. Do you think that this is an original? That is his autograph. I mean, that's the way he did it. Third state, more changes. If you can get one from the 1500s in its original state, it's worth $300,000. But this is not 1500 The paper is not right. The paper would be hand-laid paper much differently than this. Uh -huh. This is 1700s or 1800s paper. This thing is definitely worth some money, but I'm not really sure about the value. Normally, I'd call my buddy Brett, but he's busy with a new gallery opening, so I'm going to have to take a gamble on the price. How much did you want for it? A couple thousand dollars. Is it worth that? Maybe it's worth more. I don't know. I'll give you my one price, and that will be it. I'll give you five grand for it. How about 6000 I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you 5500 bucks. I believe it's worth right around seven. All right, if it's worth seven, how about 6500 I won't make no money. I got rent, I got employees, I got overhead, I got power bills. Well, I got the same thing. I take all the risk, 
and you walk out with cash. No, I know 6,000. You get 5,500, I won't go up anymore. All right, okay, All right. tough negotiators. I feel really good about this buy, but I won't know for sure if the gamble is worth it till I have it appraised. Wow, Albrecht Durer, I don't get many of those. <laughs> An Albrecht Durer etching that was a first impression done right after the hand carving of the plate that piece is sold at auction for in excess of $350,000. What year was it pressed? I don't know, but I paid a lot of money for it. I hope I did all right. Well, we'll take a look. It's dark, the lines are crisp. There's obviously some conditional flaws in the border, but the composition itself is very strong. However, I don't think that this is a real early impression. The paper is too thin. I don't think it's indicative of the laid paper that they were using in the 16th century. I also don't notice in the image much in the way of burr. Basically, when Mr. Durer was doing the etching, he left little grooves of metal, and it would make for almost an impressionistic look in certain areas. And over time, once you get further and further removed from the first few impressions, you lose the burr. So I don't see much in the way of burr. However, it's almost certainly from the original plate. You can see the plate marks, the dimensions match up. I think it's a very nice impression circa 17th century. And even though it's not an early impression, it's a valuable one. I mean, I've seen pieces like this sell at auction anywhere from 20 grand to 50 grand. Yeah. <laughs> So I imagine you did pretty well. Uh, uh, I don't yeah. know what you paid for it, but... I, I paid 5500 for it. Uh, okay, wow. I said it was a gamble when I bought it. Um, but uh, thanks, man. You did great. Um, you want to put that in, like, a nice frame or something? I think we can do something for you. Yeah, something chum can't break. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime you pay $5,500 for something, that's a sizable investment. But Rick knows what he's doing. A little too much, so I'm afraid he might not need an art expert anymore. What do we have here? A couple of Victorian era stained glass windows that I inherited from my dad. When windows first started coming into houses, mm -hmm. stained glass was really expensive back then. So the owners of the house went on vacation or something. They took all the windows down. Oh, really? Because they get <laughs> stolen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming down to the pawn shop today to sell my stained glass windows. I don't have a price in mind because I don't know what they're worth. At my house, they're just sitting in a box, and they're not being displayed the way they really should be. Do you know anything about them? What I think I have is an example of combination glass, beveled glass, stained glass, and jewels. Now, this other window, I'm not sure if it's of the same era or not. Stained glass is an art form. It's a tremendous amount of work to make these things. It really came to be a really great art form, late Middle Ages. For over a 1,000 years, when most people couldn't read, churches put up stained glass windows that depicted scripture and Bible stories. They called them the poor man's Bible. What were you thinking about getting out of them? Well, what would you be willing to offer? I'll give you 400 bucks for both. 400 bucks? Ooh, that's kind of low. Um, how about 800 for the pair? How about five? Uh, it's one of those things that sits for a very long time. How about seven? Um, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll go 600 bucks and I will not go no more than that. 600 would be max. I think that 600 is a fair price. You got a deal. Okay, thanks. I'm actually very happy that we settled on six. I realize that he's taking all the risk. It's gonna take quite a while to sell these windows. A guy brought in a bunch of Star Wars action figures that came out the same year that the movie was released. I don't know anything about Star Wars, so I called up a buddy of mine to come take a look. You look like the type that had a Princess Leia poster on your wall. I still do, man. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> wow, man, these are really nice shape. Everything looks really, really nice, which sets off a lot of red flags, because there's a lot of these figures being counterfeited nowadays. These are the first release which are the most sought after in, as far as any of the Star Wars stuff goes. This is a French card here, which you never see here in the States. Does it make it worth more or less? More desire, definitely. OK. That's also the vinyl cape. Wow, that's amazing. As far as Star Wars toys go, the Holy Grail is the vinyl cape Jawa. It's one of the most sought after Star Wars figures. Let me just smell these. What are you doing? Sometimes you can smell the age of them, and you can also smell if there's glue. 
So do they smell real? They do. They smell like 1978 to me. What do you think they're worth? I mean, your blisters are clean, the cards are clean. The money piece definitely is the Jawa. I've seen this figure by itself go anywhere from eight to 10,000. I would put a conservative estimate on this collection in the nine to $12,000 range. Yes, yes. Okay. All right, appreciate it, man. No problem, at any time. See you later, man. I could reasonably expect to get somewhere between nine and $12,000. Um, I can see paying you like five, man. No, I, I don't. I gotta be the one to sell them. Yeah, I understand that, but that's not even close. You know, I, I, I'm looking for $7,500. You'll turn an instant profit of a couple thousand dollars without an effort. Yeah, man, but then I take the risk of one of my guys messing one of these up and... Well, well, then you need to hire another staff member there. <laughs> Would you take six for them? No. I, they're, they're gonna do nothing but grow in value. At $7,500, you're still gonna turn a profit of two or $3,000 with no effort. I'll give you seven grand. Why don't we split it and say $7,250? I'll give you $7,000. I mean, I'm taking all the risk here. OK, I'll do $7,000. All right, Joe. Yeah. Want to write them up? Sure. I'm pretty happy with $7,000, but um, my dad was a salesman his whole life. I think he'd be saying, Eric, you should have asked a little bit more. What do you got here? I have an elevator model from the 1860s. All right. What do we got here? You need an elevator for your house? Check this thing out. Cool. This probably was 1860s, you know, early 1870s. An elevator operator was a profession. You're telling me if someone got paid to stand in the elevator all day and push buttons. Back then, they didn't have buttons. They had, like, levers. And open the door. Sign me up. <laughs> I got a crappy job anyways. <laughs> I'm coming to the shop today to sell an antique elevator model. I have an antiques business, and my business partner and I found it in Belgium. I've been finding elevator models similar to this, and it's been selling for around 5000 So I was thinking 4000 is reasonable. It's an architectural model from the mid-1800s, which makes it really cool. Elevators back then just sucked. They, they were usually used in dockyards and building things like that. And the problem was people on a regular basis saw cables snap, and people would not get in them because they we're smart. <laughs> do you know much about this? Well, I do know that the brake was invented by Elisha Otis and the patents from 1861. This says a persons. I think that's French. OK. This was probably a French company. They had an elevator system that was competing with Otis's, but Otis had a patent, so they had to come up with their own. Otis from Otis Elevators. The way he got people to go in his elevator was in the mid-1800s. He would have his elevator, bring him up like four stories, and he'd whip out his knife and cut the cable. And you came to a slow, nice stop, and nothing would break. That's why the Otis Elevator was so great, because it had these brake shoes. It's their sales model. I mean, it's in pretty amazing shape, and it works. It does. You Are can you... actually drop it. And... Can I drop it? I don't want to mess it up. All right, so, so imagine you're in there, and the cable breaks. Still works. I'm impressed. Thank you. I'm elevated. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people who collect stuff like this. Everyone in the construction trades, architects. How much you want for it? 4000 I'll give you two. You get all the money, I take all the risk, you know? All right. $3,500? No. We need to go to a lower floor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is really not a time to be joking, Rick. We're talking money. Twenty-five hundred. I'll go twenty-one, and I shouldn't do that. Oh. I have to make money on this thing. Yes. I might get four grand out of it, but that's a, that's not an auction. There's auction right. fees. It'll take me a year to get my money. I got to spend money to ship it across <clears throat> the country somewhere. And I'm, I've Put done it... that already as well. So. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. twenty-one hundred bucks. Twenty-two hundred. No. No. Twenty-one hundred bucks. Okay, got it. Good deal. All right. Thank you. Right her up, Chum. Whew. I'll meet you right over here. All right, thank you. Don't break it. I'm happy that I was able to sell the antique elevator model today. I didn't get the 4000 that I was looking for, but 2100 I'll be able to use for my business. A guy brought in a vintage Gibson guitar owned by Peggy Eames from our gang. So I called my friend Jesse to come down and help me out. We have a really early Gibson, potentially a 1938. Wow. That's an early, early, early one. 
Well, if it's a 38, it's a super jumbo. It's the first year that they made these. And it came to be one of Gibson's most famous guitars. Everybody has played and recorded with uh, Super Jumbo, Neil Young, Lahu. So to have a first year production, that's a big deal. The 38 Super Jumbo is one of the most iconic sounding guitars there are. It was loud. It had a really nice, mellow, low end to it. They even make a reissue of the 38 the first year because it's such a significant guitar. You mind if I pick it up and take a look at it? Uh, go ahead. All right, cool. Back looks in good shape. It's all rosewood. No cracks on the back. It's a nice piece of maple, it looks like, maybe on the neck there. You got maybe one crack right here. The biggest thing is if there is a number on the inside of it ink stamped in there. Um, well, yeah, this is 1938 for sure. It's got a D for the letter, and that was only used in 1938. So. All right. It's a super jumbo. That's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> the custom work on it, that makes it really cool. Who was she? Peggy Eames, my mother, started out in the R Gang silence. And from there, she went into vaudeville when she outgrew R Gang. That is awesome. R Gang was great, but she's not super well known. Do you guys have any other concerns with the guitar? Or? Uh, no, I think he covered everything except that one big one. What's it worth? Well, without that custom work on it in this condition this is probably a forty thousand dollar guitar the custom stuff on it takes it into a different realm so you have a first year guitar with custom stuff on it this could possibly be 65 maybe even 70 grand for this guitar yeah okay it's it's a little lower than i'm anticipating getting almost double what a, a stock one is is, is pretty good <laughs> yeah <laughs> Thanks for calling me in on this one. This one's rad. All right, thanks, man. You know, a 38, this is only the second one of these I've ever seen in my life. Um, it was really cool to get to hold one in my hands and not just looking at it on the pages of a book. An amazing instrument. I'll give you $45,000 for the guitar. Well, my intention was that the money would be used as a down payment on like a getaway cottage, call it Peggy's Cabin. My asking price, 75, is really where I still want to stay on it. There's very few people in the world who have enough money to spend a stock 1938 guitar. You bump that up to the few guys who buy the custom ones, it can take me years to sell something like this. That's what I can do. I mean, I will go $45,000. Uh, if you were the end collector, is it of interest to you? Uh, that's just it. I'm not the end collector. 65 would probably move me on it. I'll go 47. I assume all the risk after that, you know what I mean? I, I think I'll haul it around a little bit longer. OK. If you change your mind, I'm here. OK, I appreciate that. There's a lot more involved here than money. The family heirloom part of it is real strong. Maybe during a family gathering once a year, Peggy's cabin, and it'd be like a memorial. Earlier, a guy brought in a sword that he claims was used during the War of 1812. It definitely looks authentic, but I've never seen a sword from this era, so I've got to have someone come in and check out the condition of it. What's up, Mark? How, How you buddy? doing? I'm oh, good, man. So what do we got? Old sword, thing in from probably around the War of 1812 era. Very nice. You found something interesting. The first thing that we look at on this is the eagle head on this one. It's badly dinged here, but the handle here is correct. The corrosion is something that you'll want to deal with. Your scabbard is original, but in horrendous shape, yes, unfortunately. Overall, what you have here is a model 1805 artillery officer's sword. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking that it was supposed to be shiny like we normally think of as sword blades. Not in this case. This one, the blade was actually blued, and then it was chased in gold. This one was probably made in France. This particular type of sword was issued from 1805 to 1815, so this would have been an issued sword for the War of 1812. So is there any way to tell if it was ever used in battle? There's no way of actually saying that it was or it wasn't. 
might have been carried into battle. However, it's an artillery sword. The artillery fire cannons. They don't lead charges with their sword. How rare would you say it is? They're not real common. It's one that a sword collector would come in and say, oh yeah, I need that to fill out my run of US military swords. All right, Mark, appreciate it, man. Thanks not a lot. problem. So now that we know a little bit more about it, how much are you looking to get out of the sword? Well, I'd like to get $5,000 for it. Um, if I bought it from you for $5,000, I'd have to try to sell it for seven. And the $7,000 sword is just not there. I think we're more about in the $500 range. Given the age and the historical value of it, I'd like to get more than that. What about, uh, I mean, $2,000? I mean, if the sword was in perfect condition, we might have like a two dollars or $3,000 sword here. But it's just not. Pay a thousand for it, and I'm taking a risk there, man. I really am. I mean, it's a piece of history. Twelve. We'll go eleven hundred bucks. Eleven fifty. <laughs> All right, man. Deal. All right, eleven fifty. I would have liked to have seen more, but given the condition, I'm satisfied with eleven fifty. And it's going straight to my wife. Hey, um, it's you again. I'm back. I got more cool stuff. Okay. Um, I'm gonna get Chubb. All right. Chubb. Your yeah. guy's here. Oh, hey, what's up? Hey, Chum. I've been traveling around, I've been thrifting, I've been finding good stuff. Now I'm back at the pawn shop, and I hope Chum likes what I brought him. I like this relationship. I'll go find cool stuff, cheap, sell it here, leave them room to make some money. I'll do that again every day. It's always interesting to see what you're gonna bring in. Heck yeah. This is pretty cool, man. Where'd you get this? So Margie died, and I was at her estate sale. So I bought a bunch of her stuff. She was some type of stewardess back during the Vietnam era. What makes you think it's from Vietnam? The patches. I looked up the patches, and they go with different squadrons. It's pretty cool, though. I definitely like that. The patches on there are really cool. Black Sabbath. Rock and roll. That's right. So these are early Black Sabbath when they were on the Vertigo label. And that one's got the original poster in it. It's almost impossible to find it with the poster. Mind if I open it up and take a look? No. I know the posters are pretty hard to come yeah. up. That tear right there is going to affect the value. But it's definitely really cool, though. I mean, I've seen this album hundreds of times, never seen the poster in it. So the last thing I got is an Adventureland bowl set, 50th anniversary of Disneyland. And there's two pieces. Looks like it's in really good condition. It has the 50th year anniversary logo with the castle and everything. Everything Disney is collectible. Yep. It's got that cool tiki vibe going for it. It's probably not going to be a hard sell. What's the lowest you would take on this? I probably wouldn't go any lower than uh, 500. I'll give you 250. No. <laughs> 250. You got tiki fans looking for it, and you got Disney fans looking for it. I mean, realistically, could you do four? That's going to be my top dollar on this. I could go four. The records, I would love to have these. What do you want for that? 800 for the pair. Well, I know I've seen these sell to three to $400 in the recent market, so I'd like to be in them at 250 Each? Together. Oh, no, that's way too low. There's a rip in the poster. That rip does a lot to the value. Oh, yeah. If you could do 350 for the pair. This is me taking a risk. $300, I'll meet you in the middle. <laughs> All right. And the dress. How much did you want for this? I was thinking 400. I want this, but I'm not going to be able to go anywhere near 400. OK. What neighborhood could you get into? I'll give you $99 more than you paid for it, 100 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I could do 100 bucks on it. It's in pretty good shape. I would go to 200. I'll go up a little more, like 130. If you do 150, I'll, I'll meet you there. 140. <laughs> That's the best I can do. <laughs> and right. I'm only buying it because... I'll do 140. I like you, and I want you to keep bringing stuff in. All right, yeah. It's never easy, but it's always a pleasure. Let me write this stuff up, and I'll get you a ticket. Cool. Hey, what can I help you with? I've got a, uh, an old chest here, Buffalo Bin. He was in the uh, uh, Buffalo Bill Wild West show. OK, so do you know who Buffalo Bin was, or...? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. OK. He has uh, some photos. Some puppets is all in here as well. OK. Ventriloquist doll. <laughs> he still talks. <laughs> Hi, chum. <laughs> I can't 
came down to the pawn shop today to try to sell my Buffalo Bin collection. Buffalo Bin had ties with Buffalo Bill. I'm hoping to get at least 5,000 out of it. I can't have it in house, mainly because my wife thinks that the dolls that are in the box are pretty creepy. Okay, where did you get all this stuff? Well, I, uh, I remodeled a, a house uh, for a lady in Colorado, and she says, do you want it? I said, sure, I'll take it. Do you know if there's any relation to Buffalo Bill, or? He was in the Buffalo Bill show. Okay. And that's supposed to be Buffalo Ben right there? Yeah. I mean, Buffalo Bill was a really great character. Uh, he had an amazing show. I mean, he toured all over the United States. He toured all over Europe. He uh, performed for Kings and Queens. And that stuff, I know, is worth a lot of money. Buffalo Bill Cody is an American legend. The guy was a soldier, buffalo hunter, and all-around badass. He had hundreds of people working on his Wild West show. And anything associated with him can be worth money, maybe even Buffalo Ben. You have like two things here. You have some this Buffalo Ben guy stuff, and you have a Punch and Judy show. You ever see the little puppet shows? No. Well, they'd reach up, and you would have the little Punch and Judy shows, and here, here, here. And they would argue with each other, and they would always end up fighting. Okay. Always. I don't like you. I don't like you. I think you're ugly. <laughs> don't break this thing, it's old. I've seen Punch and Judy puppets, I've seen ventriloquist dummies, but this collection is really unusual. I'm figuring the dating on some of this stuff is around 1890. I don't have a clue. Um, the little ventriloquist doll here, um, that's got newer clothes on it. I'm just sort of baffled here by the whole thing. I don't know if this is Buffalo Bill's cousin or who the hell this guy is. I've got a friend who runs a Wild West uh, museum. Let me get him down here, we'll get this thing figured out. Okay. okay. The guys don't know what is in this box. I don't know what it is, so I can't wait to hear what their expert has to say. He started out as a buffalo hunter on the plains. He was a scout for the Army, and he actually got the Congressional Medal of Honor because of his service. Wow. So Buffalo Bill really had a strong basis for a Wild West show in his background. You know, I've never heard of Buffalo Ben, but Buffalo Bill had a lot of characters, performers in his show, and we're always learning about new ones, and so I'm hoping maybe we'll find something more about this guy. You know, we have some really nice stuff linking him to 1930s circus activities. The question is, from the 1930s back to 1886, 87, was he really involved with Buffalo Bill's Wild West? This gives me a concern because, actually, this was an image used by Buffalo Bill to promote his Wild West, and the name Buffalo Bill's been taken off of here. <laughs> it's like Buffalo Ben just kind of stole it yeah. from Buffalo Bill. This other photograph here, uh, taken in 1886. This guy is a Lakota chief known as Red Shirt. He okay. is not <laughs> Buffalo Ben at all. We have photographs of him. His face is pretty familiar to me. Unfortunately, Buffalo Ben was not with Buffalo Bill's Wild West. We have some really neat circus stuff. We have some authentic items, but Buffalo Ben himself isn't really authentic. He was one of these guys that created a persona for himself long after Buffalo Bill and everybody who could have contradicted him were dead. Wow, so he's self-made famous. That's right, he was a legend in his own mind. <laughs> All right, so do you think it's worth anything? It's interesting, but you don't have that strong value that you would see if he had really been with Buffalo Bill's Wild West. All right, thanks for coming in, man. Thank you. After looking closer, unfortunately, the materials just don't fit. His stories don't fit. The photograph uh, that shows him, theoretically, with the show is somebody totally different. Well, he... Apparently not in the show. Um, yeah, this, I'm not really big on this now. I mean, it's basically from a con man. But you haven't lost the battle yet because this stuff has me really intrigued. I have a buddy who just knows everything there is to know about toys. So let me get him down here. Johnny will know all about this stuff. Great. Even though Buffalo Ben turned out to be a fake, some of these old dolls could be worth a lot of money. There might just be a jackpot here after all. Johnny, my man. Hey, what's up, guys? This is what I called you about. Taking it way back with this stuff. The guys usually call me down when they want to know the history of a piece or if they want to know its value as well. This is definitely a cool mix of pieces here with the case and everything else. Looks like he traveled, maybe carnivals, circuses, 
and this is probably what he used to perform and make a living at the time. These are, looks like Punch and Judy uh, puppets. I would say from the early 1900s here. Back then, this was the big thing. I mean, people came from all over to see these puppeteers, uh, these ventriloquist performers, and it's amazing to see this stuff here at the shop. And what about the ventriloquist doll? I would say the maker definitely by looking at the face, it's definitely made by Charles Mack. Have you heard of Charlie McCarthy? Yeah, I remember he was a dummy on television. He was really big in the, what, the 40s, 50s, 60s? Yeah, the guy who made this made that as well. Theodore Mackinson was a big manufacturer of ventriloquist figures in the early 1900s and continued on to the 50s, and, and they were still big name back then. All right, Johnny, does this stuff have any value? Because my man ain't been so lucky with everything else so far. Everything seems in fair condition for the time. Most of these were hand-painted, and, and a lot of that has remained intact. The clothing's original. Also, the Charles Mack piece, which is pretty decent for how old it is. I would put a, a total value at about 5,000 for the whole collection here. Great. Okay. Wow. All right. Um, thanks, man. You're the cool. best. All right. See you Take later. Take care. Um, yeah, a little bit of a roller coaster ride today, huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, this stuff right here, I don't see no money there. Just plain and simple. This stuff, what do you want for it? I was hoping uh, to get five grand out of it. Yeah, five grand, I'm not going to do. I mean, because I'm. Hoping to get that. I'll give you three grand. With with the box being a you know a decorative piece, uh, you this keep stuff the box. being extra. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um. Thirty-eight. I'll go thirty-two hundred. And remember, I pay you money, I take all the risk, you walk away, and life is good. I think we got a deal. All right, it's a deal, man. Write them up, chum. Let me show them. These dolls are awesome. Took half a day of work, but what a payoff. So, what in the hell is this? Miami Dolphin Stadium. I'm assuming an architectural rendering or something? Yeah made out of cork board and... I think they used balsa wood. It's uh, definitely not made out of Legos. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one original architect's model of Joe Robbie Stadium constructed, so this was the model made to sell the concept to the fans in the city of Miami. I'm hoping to sell this today for about $12,000. That's amazing. Well, it's the same stadium they're playing now, right? Just Correct. A, a name change? Correct. Back in the mid-80s, this was commissioned by Joe Robbie, the owner of Miami Dolphins, so that he could have this to show in all the different malls and grocery stores and different places around Miami. Yeah, he had been trying to get a new stadium for the Dolphins for probably about 10 years. Think about it. By the early 80s, Dan Marino's tearing up league passing records, but they're still sharing a stadium with a college team. <laughs> right. So Joe Robbie decided he was going to pay to build it himself. So where did you get this? Well, I got it from the city of Cleveland because Art Modell, the owner of the Cleveland Browns, he liked this design so much as well. This is what he wanted built there too, so. How did that work out for him? <laughs> Not too well. Uh, city of Cleveland uh, didn't want to pony up money like Joe Robbie did, so we all know the rest of the story. This Art Modell guy kept bumping heads with the city of Cleveland. So eventually he gave up, moved his team to Baltimore and created the Ravens. It was a tough road for Cleveland fans, but fortunately, they got a new Browns team a few years later. God, it must suck being in Cleveland, man. The, the best thing you have to look at is a <laughs> copy of the Dolphin Stadium? <laughs> yeah, hey, come on, don't be brutal. <laughs> we get enough razzing. You know, there's a lot of fanatical football fans out there that would love to have something like this. What are you looking to get out of it, man? I was looking at somewhere around 12,000. Whew. The NFL Hall of Fame said I should uh, insure it for a minimum of 25000 But you know what the NFL Hall of Fame didn't do? They didn't write you a check. <laughs> How about ten? I see why you would think it'd be worth so much money, and it, I'm sure there's somebody out there that's going to pay it, but this isn't something that's easy to sell. Uh, I'd give you, like, four grand for it. Ooh, that, that's, that's pretty rough. 
This was Joe Robbie's prize for what he was trying to build for his team and for the city of Miami. How about eight? It's not going to happen. I mean, think about it, dude. I take all the risk. I'm the one that actually has to find someone to buy it. It's going to cost me time, money, and resources. I'll go 6,000 bucks. It's the most I can do. How about seven? Big house, I'll build you this for 3,000. <laughs> 6,000 bucks, man. That's what I'm willing to pay. Ooh. I think you're going to make a lot of money on this. All right, deal, man. Chum, figure out something to do with this and write it up, please. What am I going to do with this? I do think that the 6,000 is still lower than what it's really worth, but I'm trying to move into a smaller place, and I really don't want to take it with me. So I'm OK with it. Earlier, a guy brought in a team photo of the 1915 Red Sox with Babe Ruth in his rookie year. It could be a big ticket item if it's real. So I asked Jeremy to come down and give me his expert opinion. Man, 1915 Boston Red Sox? Mm-hmm. 20-year-old Babe Ruth. That's right. That is really cool. I mean, who could have possibly imagined what history had in store for this guy? With baseball being in its infancy and Babe Ruth came into the sport, you know, there's only very few media outlets covering it. So having anything related to Babe Ruth surviving 100 years later is an amazing find. So I mean, one of the biggest urban legends in baseball is, you know, how did Babe Ruth get the name The Babe? The story goes back to his days when he was in the minor leagues with the Baltimore Orioles. A uh, guy by the name of Jack Dunn kind of took him under his wing since he was underage at the time and really took care of him. So his other teammates kind of busted his balls a little bit about it. You know, oh, he's Jack's newest babe and everything. And it kind of stuck after that. Cool. Here's my concerns. OK. It's open. And everything I see PSA is generally sealed up. Sometimes. With PSA, you can have discretion as to whether you want it encapsulated or just stickered. Uh, in this case, it has just a sticker on it. And in looking at this one, I mean, the sticker, the letter, the condition, everything's authentic on this. OK, that's cool. OK, so the big question, what do you think it's worth? I can't emphasize how exceedingly rare it is to find an image of Babe Ruth, especially from his rookie year. So these are actually a really big deal. And honestly, man, in this kind of condition, on a good day, I'd, I'd say you could sell this for about 10 grand. OK. Thanks, man. You got it, man. But when you're talking about a photograph from his rookie season, 100 years old, there are far less of those out there than there are autographed baseballs or other items. I don't think it would last long in any retail setting. Well. Verified. I mean, what's your best price on it? Um, what about 12000 There's no way in the world that's going to happen, because I don't think I can get that much out of it. You heard Jeremy. On a good day, I could sell it for 10000 So I'll give you seven grand. Seven grand. Wow. You heard what the man said. They rarely come up. I think it'll sell fast. I really do. 11,000. No. I will go seven. I take all the risk. I have stuff all over the place in here that I thought would sell real quick. Will you do 8,500? No, I will do 7,000. That's what I can do. I've come down. You haven't bumped up not even a nickel. I won't bump up a dime. Yeah, I, I don't think I can let it go for that price. But thanks anyway. All right, thanks for coming in, though. All right, OK. I'm disappointed he didn't budge from 7000 I thought he would at least come up $500. Well, it looks like it gets back to the auction houses and see if I can get a little more money for it. What do we got? I have something really unique to show you today. It's a 17th century powder flask. If I understood it, it's for a dueling pistol. This is really neat. We have the fur de lays. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. <laughs> um, that is, uh, that would make it French. Fur de lay, fur de lay. Fleur de lay. Whatever. <laughs> I have a 17th century powder flask. It's ivory, and I think it's from France. My dad made black powder guns for a living, so he collected a lot of things around that world. I want to get $20,000 for the gunpowder flask. OK, that is definitely cool. Do you know much about it? Well, it's a 17th century powder flask. 
You know, I always pictured this really famous guy that won a lot of duels, and that was his powder flask. I think it's more jewelry than it is actually used for a gun. Oh. A really, really rich dude had this. Guys like that, they never used this. There was nothing to do if you were rich, okay? <laughs> if you were poor, you woke up in the morning, you went to work, and then by the time you got home, you collapsed and did it again the next day. You worked like a dog all day long. Now, if you were super rich, it's not like you went and go, well, here today I'm gonna get my sports car, today I'm gonna get my Harley. Maybe we'll go to the lake and get on the jet ski. There was none of that. So back then, what they did was they got dressed up and went to fancy parties. This would hang on a guy's belt. So this is more form over function. This oh, yeah, this was dressing up. Oh. This is ivory. Um, that is bone in there. That was pretty common because what they used to do with ivory a lot is like the background and stuff like that that you couldn't see that well. They put bone in there because it was a lot cheaper than ivory. Oh. Whoever made this, he was good. You see how he inlaid this with gold. And this is one bluing technique where you get that color, a different bluing technique where you get that color, and a third one there. Bluing was an art. And the color of the bluing was dependent upon the temperature of the metal, the oils where you were using, and everything else like that. Now, how old it is, that's debatable. Is there any markings on it anywhere? I Nothing that really gives it a date or a, a time stamp. But if you look at the guy on the front, he kind of addresses the 17th century. And my dad always said it was from that era, so. OK. Um, you know, today you can go out and buy things with George Washington's picture on it. That doesn't give it a date. <laughs> uh, but were they made of ivory today? Uh, there was no problem getting ivory up to, like, 30 years ago, so. How much are you going to get out of this? $20,000 is fair for something this age, this ornate. Let me just call someone up. Someone's going to know a lot more than I am. They're going to know about the value better. But I have a friend who will know everything. Yeah, that works. So, so hang out 15 minutes, and uh, I'll be right back. Sounds good. Really looking forward to the expert getting a look at this gunpowder flask. I think he's going to probably say it's worth a lot more than I'm asking. Here it is. Wow. It's old. Exactly how old, I don't know. The detail is stunning. The Florida de lis puts it absolutely French and also somehow related to the monarchy because of the crown. And that was not done lightly. This is somebody who has permission or is somehow associated with the crown. You didn't just decide you wanted a priming flask and throw the crown on there. But on the other side, this is very clearly King Henry II. So King Henry II died in 1559. Oh. But it's not that old. What I think this is, is a tribute to King Henry II. Now, Henry II was a really popular king at the time because he was an avid hunter and an outdoorsman, and he was always celebrated by French kings going on, most notably Louis XIV, the Sun King, the man who built Versailles. I do think that it would have belonged to one of his courtiers. OK, that is definitely cool. The French court was notorious for its competition. Status was everything. And part of what helped you attain status were high-priced accessories. This would have been one of the finest pieces of craftsmanship you could have purchased. These two hooks here would have connected to some type of fancy lanyard that went around the courtier's neck and under their arm, and it would have hung there. And you can see this is something to other people to be envious of. Almost like today, a man wears an expensive watch. So what do you think it's worth? <laughs> it's in exquisite condition. Um, my best guess is that at the right auction, $20,000. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thanks, appreciate that. Look, a 17th century ivory primer flask would be valued by collectors not just of militaria, but also of art. So you really got the best of both worlds. It's a great piece of history. It really is. I mean, what's your best price on it? You heard the man, $20,000 seems like a pretty fair price. $20,000 in the right auction, or I pay you 10 grand. You walk away with the money, I take all the risk. What about 15,000? I'll give you 11 grand for it. God, it's hard. Could you do 12? <sighs> all right, 12,000, we got a deal. Thank you. All right, I'll meet you right over there. Thank you. 
So instead of a powder flask, it was like a man purse purse thing? No. <laughs> what do we have here? Brought you some pieces of the Hindenburg. Pieces of the Hindenburg? Oh, yes. All right. This is such great history. To this day, the Hindenburg is still the largest airship ever built that carried passengers. You know, it was almost three football fields long, and it had, I think, seven million cubic feet of hydrogen in it. I mean, that's a pretty big floating bomb. <laughs> I'm coming into the pawn shop today to sell my pieces of the Hindenburg airship crash. I acquired these pieces of the Hindenburg because my father was on the security detail the first night when the airship crashed. I'd like to get 20000 If I make a sale today, I'd like to purchase a new automobile. This is some incredible stuff here. The Germans built the Hindenburg in the early 1930s, and it was an engineering marvel. You could get across the Atlantic in, like, two days. Most people think it, it crashed on its maiden voyage. It didn't. It had already been to New York a couple times. On May 6, 1937, the Hindenburg was completing a flight from Frankfurt, Germany, to Lakehurst, New Jersey, where they had a ginormous hangar for it. And they dropped one of the lines to tie it off, and all of a sudden, the thing burst into flames. So this has to come from the tail. Believe it or not, this piece right here is worth more than the, the other ones combined, because that is the rarest piece, due to the fact that the fire started in the tail section. Yeah. This is the normal skin. It's a great size piece. And we have a Western Union telegraph here. Dear Mama, was sent to Lakehurst Thursday night for guard duty at Hindenburg crash. Nothing left of ship. Most all bodies burnt beyond recognition. Love, Jimmy. So how did you get it? Well, my father was on security detail the first night. Did your father send this? Yes. Oh, OK. That's really cool. I'm pretty impressed. So big question, how much you want? Uh, 20,000. I absolutely love it. And I'll give you 10 grand. Um. Understand. When I go to sell this, I take all the risk. You walk out of here with a pocket of money, $10,000 is a fair price. 12.5? I'll do 11 and not a penny more. OK. We got a deal. Deal. All right, sweet. Um, I will meet you right over there. We'll do some paperwork, and I'll get you paid. All right, thanks. Very rarely do I get this excited over an item that comes to my shop. To have this telegraph from somebody who was there basically doubled the value. Now I'm gonna get this all nicely framed up, and I can't wait. Check this out, guys. Pretty amazing. What exactly is it? Pieces of the Hindenburg. With a telegram from the guy who was there, what do you think? I think it would have been much faster just to send a text. What are you talking about? I mean, instead of a telegram. They didn't have mm. cell phones in 1937. We have all the pieces and all the provenance in the world. Okay. Yay, Rick. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> this is cool. Finally, someone who can appreciate the amazing historical significance of this. This is one of those iconic unfortunate disasters in American and German history. The Hindenburg was Nazi Germany's ultimate airship. They started building in 1931, started flying in 1936. One of the interesting things about this particular landing is this was the first time that you saw a disaster happening almost in real time. The newscaster who was filming for a throwaway piece for between movies, and all of a sudden the fire starts. People are jumping out. People are dying right People before. People are jumping out. Yes, because it's burning right in People front say. of him. You know, and one of the lines he used was "Oh, the humanity." That line entered into the public lexicon. This is too much for me to think about, Mark. <laughs> I did not come here with the intention on learning today. 35 died in the crash, 62 survived. When you look at the footage of the crash, it's still amazing to me that that many survived. It's amazing that anybody survived. Yes, it is. Yeah, it was just a massive fireball. The cool thing about this is I have part of the structure and the fabric and part of the tail, the rarest part of the Hindenburg. Yeah, because that's where the fire started. And to have that particular telegram, that's an amazing telegram. So you guys think it's cool now? It's pretty cool, Dad. Awesome.
Let's go. I mean, I'm just telling you, kids today, it's just like these, <laughs> this younger generation is just ridiculous. Okay, I got something you might be interested in. Okay. 1970 here, Octavia, and it's a Joe Sifford edition. Sifford, yeah. Formula One uh, yeah, he was race a car. Yeah, this yeah. is cool. He's still listed as like one of the greatest race car drivers of all time. Oh, yeah. He was a Swiss guy. Yep. Um, the yeah, Swiss Steve McQueen. Well, I wouldn't go that far. Well, the watch was my dad's. He bought it brand new back in 1970 and keeps perfect time. The watch is in real good condition. It's mostly been sitting in a box. I wear it every now and then. You know, I'd like to maybe get a get a new dirt bike and you know, don't tell anybody that, but this is a pretty amazing cool watch. It's pretty rare. And the reason these are pretty rare is these weren't popular watches. It was only the hardcore race fans buying watches like oh, this yeah. because the speedometers were not really accurate. But if you had mile markers on a road and you had an accurate stopwatch in your car, you could figure out exactly how fast you were going. Um, and that's the neat thing about watches because he wore the same model. He didn't wear this one, but he wore this model. That's what gives it 80% of its value. There's something really cool about Hewer watches from the 60s and the 70s. Everybody loves them. Steve McQueen wore one in the movie Le Mans, ended it up selling for over $800,000. Now tell me, did you replace the band? Or did I, he get it this way? You know, I think he must have replaced it. I mean, okay. he wore it a lot, and I know, you know, he had all kinds of different bands. And The original band on this is very distinct. Right. It really hurts the fact that you don't have the original band. Mm. But I love it that you have the paperwork with the original serial number on it. So often you'll see these things, they'll have the original paperwork, but it's not filled out. All right. How much you want for it? I was looking at 12000 <sighs> Um, That's tough. I'll tell you what, um, I'll see if I can make a deal with you, okay? And if we can make a deal, I will go pop the back and make sure everything's correct. I just wanna make sure it's the original movement from that time period. All right. Okay? I just don't wanna take it apart, do all this work, and then you say no to my price. Do you, right. you understand me? Yeah. I'm thinking like seven grand. Seven grand? Um, you know, how about, uh, I could probably do 10. Right. I mean, it's got all the original stuff. I got the it original does, box. It doesn't have all and, the original uh, stuff. It doesn't have the original band. That is a very big deal. And could you do nine? I'll go eight. Mm. I, I have to find someone to buy it. I got to do all the work. How about 85? I'll go 8,000. Yeah, I can, I can do eight. Okay. All right, just remember, I'm going to go take the back off and make sure everything's legit. All right? Okay. Okay. All right, be right back. All right. Well, I'm feeling pretty good. That You know, that was probably the least amount I'd take for it. And, uh, you know, it seems like a fair price. I know he's back there somewhere taking apart the watch. I'm probably more nervous he'll break something. But, uh, no, I know it's legit. I'm pretty confident about that. Okay, we have a problem. Oh. Um... But apparently it's going to be my problem, not yours. I'll take the risk. Um... Obviously, he never had it serviced because the back oh, yeah. will not come off. Oh, no. This thing is stuck on there. Yeah, it's probably been at least 25 okay. years. I don't foresee there being a problem, but if there is, I'm screwed. I'm really happy he's still stuck to the deal, even though he couldn't get the back of the watch off. Hopefully, we'll, you know, be out, out in the desert racing a new dirt bike next week.